Scots are famously canny with their money. They know how hard money is to come by, how hard it is to keep, how it must be husbanded. Well, numbers are important. Facts are chills that win a ding. And so our next speaker, I'm glad to say, is one of the world's leading economists. He is Nobel area brilliant. He's Scottish from Skye. His name is Professor Ronald MacDonald from the great University of Glasgow. Please welcome Ronald MacDonald. Thank you very much, George, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I should say at the outset that I'm more than happy to answer any questions in my paper in the Q&A time that we've devoted uh, after the break. Now, I'm going to say a few words as to how I uh, came here this evening. Why am I here this evening? It's not an existentialist question, I can assure you. Um, <laughs> as, as George said, I'm an economist. I'm not a pol politician. So what I have to say tonight, I say as a professional economist. And I believe what I have to say is an important aspect of me discharging my professional duties as a professional economist. About 30 years ago, I completed a PhD at Manchester University, and the topic of that PhD was currency issues. It was about currency regime issues, the very thing that seems to be at the center of the debate on independence in Scotland. And little did I think 30 years ago that I would be speaking at an event on this important topic amongst others. Since I completed my PhD, I've published widely on currency issues, on the interface between currency choice and macroeconomics, and I've advised most central banks, governments, the European Commission, and the International Monetary Fund on these issues, and last year the fund appointed me as a monetary advisor. Now, until 18 months ago, I had no formal involvement in the referendum debate. However, around then, I started to see papers coming out from the Scottish Government and others which put the currency issue regime central to the economics debate. Now, many have been surprised that the currency has become the dominant theme in the economics uh, debate. I'm not surprised, uh, given my background in uh, currency economics, it's not a surprise to me because currency is much more than just the money in your pockets. It's about how that currency is backed up by a central bank, at the moment the Bank of England, and it's also about how we relate our currency to other countries' currencies. Do we fix them or do we have some kind of floating arrangement? Now, if you don't get the currency issue right, you're going to get things really badly wrong, whether you're uh, an independent country already, or thinking about becoming an independent country. Specifically, if you get the currency issue wrong, it can have dramatic ramifications for your inflation, the competitiveness of the things you trade, the goods and services we trade, which is very important, obviously, in Scotland, and it can have implications for unemployment um, and economic growth. So it's a very important issue. So, a couple of numbers just to set the scene. And these numbers reflect Scotland's total output, what economists refer to as GDP or gross, do, gross domestic product. The first one I'm going to give you is 126 billion pounds. That is Scotland's GDP without including the value added from oil. If you include the value added from oil, it goes up to 140 billion. Now, I have to say to ensure that my results or my figures are not biased. I've always taken figures that favor the Scottish government's position in the sense that if it's something that would increase the revenue position of an independent Scotland, I go with the oil figure, which is bigger, as I've said. If it's something which would reduce that uh, or paint a better picture, I go with the lower figure. And I'm happy to discuss that afterwards. But these figures are intended to um, give you a picture of the size of the Scottish economy, and what I hope is that you can put the other numbers I give you against this background. 
Now, if I can turn to the issue of currency, which, as everybody knows, has become so important, and it's not something we should brush away because it affects really everything in the economy, our pensions, our employment, our economic growth, and so on. Now, as we know, the Scottish government's uh, position on currency is that they would like to retain a formal commitment to the sterling monetary union post-independence. That is, they want to continue with the current currency arrangement. This is referred to as Plan A. Now, we know that Plan A has been ruled out politically, and um, as I understand it, that is because the politicians want to protect UK taxpayers in totality. Rather than simply looking at Scottish taxpayers, they, are, they have a commitment to look at uh, taxpayers throughout the United Kingdom, clearly. I'm not making a political statement here. I want to look at the economic reason why this policy would be a disaster for an independent Scotland. Now, to understand why it would be a disaster, what I want to do is consider a very simple thought, uh, thought experiment. If Scotland were to become independent, it would have the right to issue its own currency, to set up its own central bank and have its own currency. I'll call that the Scots pound. Now, what the Scottish government are proposing is that if Scotland were to become independent on day one of independence, that Scots pound would be fixed irrevocably to sterling at a one-to-one -one basis. The main disadvantage of tying your currency in this fixed way is that you've no control over your monetary policy, you've no control over your interest rate, and specifically, you've no control over your exchange rate, obviously, because you've fixed it, you've locked it to the foreign country. Is that important, you may ask yourself? I would argue it's fundamentally important that an independent Scotland would have its own currency. Now, the reason for that is that if Scotland were to become independent, and um, most commentators, including the Treasury, accept this next argument, it would become a net exporter of hydrocarbons, assuming that it achieved its geographic share of North Sea oil. So let's assume it does. The Treasury, in most of its uh, uh, counterfactual simulations, assumes that. So it's a perfectly reasonable assumption, I think, to make that Scotland would become a net exporter of hydrocarbons. That is a crucially different position to the position today. Specifically, as the price of oil goes up, then your overall price level will go up. But the price of oil can also come down, as, as Brian Wilson mentioned, but the significant thing here is your overall price level does not go down if the price of oil goes down. Now, what this does, okay, this is a little mini lecture, but it's very important. What this does is that if your main trading competitor is not an exporter of oil, and of course, if we're taking the geographic share of oil, the rest of the UK would not be uh, an exporter of oil, it would be a net importer, that will not be happening there. What that means in, 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 in short then is that our net exports become uncompetitive relative to our main trading partner. It's something called the Dutch disease. It's not something I've made up tonight. It's something which is crucially important and occurs in any country which is an exporter, particularly of oil. And if you look at the Norwegian experience, those of you who, who've been to Norway will, will know what I'm talking about, that you know, if you go into a restaurant or if you go to a pub, a pint of beer is horrendously expensive, and that's because of this effect that I'm referring to. Now, if you've no way of addressing this, it could result in very serious problems. Now, based on Scottish government trade data, I've estimated that an independent Scotland, if it were to fix its currency along the lines of Plan A, will become uncompetitive by seven percentage points per year. That is a huge amount, 7% a year. To, to offset that, you're either going to have a massive increase in productivity, the like of which no country has ever seen, or more realistically, to maintain your competitiveness, you're going to have, some, have, to have some form of austerity uh, which would involve wage and price cuts. This is what economists call the internal adjustment mechanism.
It's what we've seen happening in Spain recently and in Greece. Because these countries are fixed to the euro, they become extremely uncompetitive. You've had sort of rising unemployment levels and falling wages in order to restore competitiveness. So that's the first thing to note about having, uh, of pegging to sterling, of fixing your exchange rate to sterling. It's a very bad idea. It's going to lead inevitably to austerity pro pro problems because you have no way of addressing your competitiveness. Now, if Scotland were to become independent, the Scottish government have made clear that it's prepared to accept its fair share of UK debt. There, there are interesting issues about reneging on that, and, and we're, I'm happy to discuss that perhaps in the Q&A, but let's assume that they, they, they are committed to paying their fair share of, of the UK debt. Well, that number is 120 billion pounds. Let me repeat that. The, the fair share of UK debt is 120 billion pounds, so roughly equal to the whole of Scotland's GDP. Now, the Scottish government have said that uh, there are two ways of, of paying that. One is referred to as the clean break. On, on separation, you would pay that as a one-off. Clearly, that's not going to be possible. So they prefer to pay it in annual installments, much, much like we pay off our mortgage. Now, if you look at what these annual installments are going to cost, and I haven't seen that the, government, uh, the Scottish government uh, reveal these figures, but if you look at them, they're all there in the public domain, then if you take a figure of 120 billion and you assume, say, an annual repayment of, um, shall we say, 5%, which doesn't seem unreasonable, that's a, a six billion um, pounds per year repayment of the capital, you then have to pay interest on the remaining debt, which if you pay six billion in the first year, there'd be 144 left in the next year. That would add in another five billion and then on top of that, you've got a five billion deficit. So your debt overhang, what you've got to finance in an independent Scotland is 16 billion pounds. That's 13% of GDP. Now, whichever way you cut that, that is not a sustainable figure. There is no economist on earth who would say that is a sustainable figure. And financial markets will um, clearly tell you that you will not be able to borrow that sum of money. If you were, the rates would be astronomical. So what that's going to mean is that figure is going to have to come down to a sustainable level, which is about 3%, as I said. That's a gap of 10% of, of an independent Scotland's GDP. Where is that money going to come from? Now, bear in mind that the total health budget of the NHS is £12 billion per annum. That's what we're talking about here. To pay off this inherited uh, debt and deficit, we're going to have to pay approximately the, the, the equivalent of the National Health Service. So we're talking about public service cuts and or quite drastic tax rises, which I've no doubt would leave mobile skilled people and associated companies moving out of Scotland, with implications obviously for tax revenue and the worse, further worsening of that fiscal position. So that is a real uh, figure to dwell on and to think about, because it is a figure which is a totally realistic figure, and it has to be addressed. I've not seen any discussion in the media about addressing that figure. Now, an alternative to um, fixing your currency in a formal currency arrangement is to hold the pound anyway. And this seems to be the Scottish Government's plan B. Now, this sounds really easy. It, it's certainly something that you could do. No one could stop you holding the pound. But again, I have to ask, is it a good thing? Does it address the key issues of an independent Scotland? Well, first of all, you would still have that debt deficit problem that I mentioned of around uh, 16 billion. That would still be there. So you'd still have that austerity program you would still not be able to address your competitiveness. That would still be worsening at 7% per annum because this is just another form of fixed exchange rate. You would have no means of controlling your inflation because you wouldn't have a central bank in this model. But most worryingly of all, and this is something that's come to light in recent weeks, um, 
if Scotland were to become independent, sterling would be a foreign currency. Sterling would be a foreign currency. It would be foreign exchange. So you would need to accumulate foreign exchange. Now, if the Scottish banks were to stay in Scotland, this would create a big problem because they have uh, Scottish people based in Scotland or, or people resident in Scotland rather, have around 120 billions worth of sterling assets with the Scottish banks. So an independent Scotland, if these banks stayed in Scotland, and of course there's a question mark over whether they would, an independent Scotland would have to get reserves of 120 billion pounds. Where would it get these from? Additionally, to run a, any kind of currency system away from a uh, monetary union, you've got to have around 40 billions worth of foreign exchange reserves. So that adds up to about 160 billion pounds worth of reserves. So to have to even think about getting these reserves, you're going to have to run massive fiscal surpluses. So that, I mean, these numbers are just so mind-boggling that the holding the pound anyway, so-called sterlingization, just simply isn't going to happen, okay? There's no way an independent Scotland could run such a, a system. The only viable option is to have a separate currency. That is the only option that allows you to address the competitiveness issue I mentioned above, so you can rule out the costs of currency crisis, and you can also deal with the competitiveness issue that I mentioned earlier, which is a real problem with any form of fixity in your exchange rate. But nonetheless, note this is not an easy option. If you have your own currency, there would be issues of the costliness of re-denominating all contracts, um, which would be an extremely costly business, um, and that would have to be paid for. I've not seen any estimates of how much that would cost, but it would be extremely costly and long drawn out. You would still inherit the debt overhang that I mentioned of 16 billion pounds. You'd need to accumulate the 40 billion pounds of foreign exchange reserves I mentioned to run such a system. Now, even if I put the debt issue to one side, if I put the debt issue to one side and we just focus on the 40 billion of foreign exchange reserves, my estimation is that to gather in the necessary reserves on an annual basis over a, say, approximately 10 years basis, you would need to go from a fiscal deficit of 5% to a fiscal surplus of about 10%. Okay, so you'd need to flip the, the, the fiscal deficit that an independent Scotland would, would have in independence over to a surplus of plus 10%. That is going to be a massively uh, destructive process. It's going to be austerity, the like of which nobody has seen in this country apart from the Great Depression in the 1930s. You're talking about uh, vast outward migration of skilled people and companies, which would lead to a downward spiral of economic activity and tax revenue, which would have a whole hysteresis effect leading to an economic collapse. So in financial and economic terms, an independent Scotland faces a very bleak future, even if it gets the currency option right. But we've been told that an independent Scotland would be better able to address the inequalities that we see in Scotland if it became independent. But how can you do this if you're facing years of austerity and potential economic collapse? How can you do this if you're cutting the living standards of everyone in Scotland, essentially? Skilled and able people will leave, profitable companies will relocate south of the border, leaving the poorest and most disadvantaged members of our society to pick up the tab. At the weekend, Prof Professor Joe Stiglitz, one of the Scottish government's advisors, indicated that there are few grounds for fear-mongering over the economy in an independent Scotland. I trust I've demonstrated why we should be very, very fearful indeed about the outcome of um, the election on Thursday if there is indeed a yes vote. All of the above referendum, I beg your pardon, all of the above leads me to conclude that the best macroeconomic framework for an independent Scotland is one in which we have both a currency union with the rest of the UK and a political union. Such a system is one in which we pool our revenues and share our risks across the whole of the UK as we do today. 
We have seen, I hope, this evening that failure to pool both risks and revenues would lead to Scotland's traded sector becoming massively uncompetitive with the serious implications this will have job for jobs and economic growth, given that 70% of our trade, at least, is with the rest of the United Kingdom. As I mentioned, the ultimate collapse of any fixed exchange rate currency union without political union could cost between 30 billion and 200 billion. We've also seen that if we go it alone, we'll have a massive annual debt deficit cost to service in the region of 16 billion. That's more than the budget of the National Health Service and it's 13% of GDP. On top of that, we've still got to generate the foreign exchange reserves that would be needed for an independent country, minimum 40 billion. The Hong Kong model's been mentioned many times, 200 billion. So all of this implies austerity. The Scottish Government are fond of saying that Scotland is one of the richest countries in the world, which is presumably as a result of the political and monetary union we've had for the last 30 years, the very thing we're trying to break up. Because of this, we can say, they say we can afford to be independent. I'd like to note, Argentina was also once feted as one of the world's richest countries, on a par, believe it or not, with the United States and United Kingdom at the peak of their pro prosperity. But Argentina is not one of the wealthiest countries today because of the misguided policies it's pursued on currency and in other areas. So in voting for independence, we are in essence being asked to trade our hard-earned right to be one of the wealthiest countries in the world to, I believe, becoming one of the poorest. Therefore, I earnestly hope that on the 19th of September, we're individually and collectively able to say, don't cry for me, Argentina. Thank you.